Good morning. Hey, Genesis Church, how are you guys this morning? Good. Go ahead and stand up with me today. We like to stand and start together as we get into worship. It's uh, maybe finally going to be nice out today. We're getting excited about the warmer weather. We're in March officially now. Spring break is coming, right? We're all excited about all of this uh, good stuff on the way. Uh, winter, is, winter is coming to an end, which is awesome. Although it's Indiana, so this is only first spring. We're going to have second spring and, you know, all those other kinds of things that'll, that'll follow. So uh, we're glad you are here with us this morning. We're glad to be able to worship the Lord together this morning. So um, one thing that I'm going to do with us this morning, and some of you will love it and some of you will tolerate it, but this is what we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to do is... Uh, in the first century church, regularly during worship, they did a call and repeat where someone would call them to say something and they would repeat it back. And it was to come into agreement about who God was so that together we were all declaring who the Lord was uh, to get us into worship. And so I'm going to do this with Psalm 118 and I'm going to say something and I'm going to have you repeat back to me. Uh, it's not exactly a repeat, but you'll say the same line over and over again, which is why it's a call and repeat. I'll call something to you, which will trigger to you to say a line. And then I'll call something to you and you'll say that same line over and over again. So your line is going to be, for his steadfast love endures forever. So let's try it. For his steadfast love endures forever. All right, so every time I go like this, that's what you're going to say, okay? So we're going to read this beginning part of Psalms 118, and we're going to just declare the goodness of God together. So Psalm 118, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Let Israel say, For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, For his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, For his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. His steadfast love endures forever. I love this passage of scripture because over and over and over again it'll go through challenges that they face and difficulties that they run up against. And over and over and over again they say, Amen. Because no matter what is going on, his steadfast love endures forever. And he is worthy to be praised simply because of that. Simply because his steadfast love endures forever. Because of who he is, we get to come here today and we get to declare as one people that God is good and his steadfast love endures forever. The end of this chapter, this first section is one that we say all the time. And we say, it says in it, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I say this with my children on the way to dropping Jack off at preschool every day, that simply because this is the day that he made, that I'm going to choose to rejoice and be glad in it. And simply because his steadfast love endures forever, we choose to come and worship our God. So let's pray together and let's join into worship. Father, we thank you that your steadfast love endures forever. And if there's nothing else that we can rely on, we can rely on that. We thank you, Father, that you have made this day. And so we will choose today to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, you are worthy to be praised. And no matter how we're feeling or what we're thinking or what's been going on, God, we choose today to leave all of that aside for this moment and come together as your children and worship you because you are a good, good Father and your steadfast love endures forever. Amen.
lost another one I am free I am free I am free Hell lost another one I am free I am free I am free Hell lost another one I am free I am free I am see hell covenant with me signed by the blood that still speaks now I'm forgiven I called righteous I'm made clean and there on the cross at Calvary you gave it all to purchase me you are the Savior and the God who said This is my redeemer. With my whole life, I will give you praise. All the glory to the one who's worthy. Because of Jesus, I have been changed.
captives and good news to the poor, healing to the broken and joy to those who mourn. You turn ashes into beauty, the ruins you restore. I am a testimony of God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow out, we may stay fast. And let my heart burn when you speak a it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the 
From the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name is your faithfulness to me those of you that are administering communion can I have you come get ready up here please I'm going to have the team sing a little bit more as we come and get the communion. And then when we get back to our seats, I, I'll share something with you and we'll, we'll do something when we have our communion. So once they get settled, you can make your way down these middle-ish aisles and come this way to get communion and then head back to your seats. this week where um, someone spoke something over me that I know is not true and made me kind of feel bad about the path that I was on in my life. And uh, they didn't intend to do it, um, but I received it and let it rattle around in my brain and started to believe it and started to feel bad about what we were talking about as being a working mother. And I started feeling guilty about not spending more time with my children or not being able to stay home with them or that somehow they were missing something from me because I was working. And I, uh, I, I know that I am doing what God has called me to do in this moment of my life. And, and I know that we've made the decision we've made for our family that God has asked us to make. And I don't know why I let it bug me, but I did. 
And it, it still kind of bugs me a little. Um, but the Lord has been speaking to me since then and, and actually through a lot of you all who have been encouraging me um, that I, I don't need to believe the things that the enemy says just because somebody says them. Um, and then I started realizing I have a lot of areas of my life that I'm not believing what God is actually saying about me and I am believing what my flesh thinks or someone else's flesh thinks or the enemy is speaking directly to me and so I just started working through that a little bit this week in the last couple of days. Uh, and I, I feel like part of that is repenting. Like, Lord, I say that you are enough for me. I say that your steadfast love endures forever, that your faithfulness is enough for me. But in moments where I, that is challenged in my life, do I really, truly believe what you've spoken about me? And one of the things I feel like we need to do this morning is I'm going to speak some some verses over you, some truth from, from things that I kind of read over myself when I go through these over the years. Um, so I'm gonna read that over you, but then I wanna take kind of a, a time, the prayer team really felt like we need to prepare ourselves to take communion this morning. And so I'd like to take a time of sort of repenting of where we have not really believed who God is and what he says about us, where we have allowed lies and doubt and fear to come in and, and dictate who we are and how we behave even right? Lack of obedience because we're afraid of uh, something that's not true about us. We're not qualified or we're not the right person to do whatever it is we're doing. And so um, I think that's how we'll spend our communion this morning, if that's okay with you guys. Um, so I'm going to read these verses over you and um, I'm going to let you spend a little time on your own. The worship team will play and whenever you feel like taking communion, we're not going to take it together this morning. Just spend time with you in the Lord. And when you feel prepared to partake in communion, uh, you can do that on your own. So I'm going to read this to you. In my great love, I have chose you over all else and gave my only son, Jesus, that all those who believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. While you were still hostile towards me, you were reconciled to me by the death of my son. Sin doesn't have the last word, grace does. Now everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. You who have believed are born again and I have adopted you. You are children of God, heirs of God. You are no longer orphans, you belong to me. And I love you as a perfect father. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you simply because you are my child and I am your father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all of your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. Delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my Son, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. And he came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you. And to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. And if you receive this gift of my son Jesus, you will receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Father, I ask that we would meditate on these scriptures, on these words from your heart, that we would believe what you've said about who you are and about who we are. And Father, we repent of anywhere that we have allowed lies, we have allowed fears, we have allowed doubts to dictate what we think about ourselves, what we think about others, what we do with our lives, God. Father, we believe that your gift of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, was enough. We thank you.
thank you, Jesus, for this reminder in communion. Help us, God, to prepare our hearts. There's somebody in here that's wondering if anyone would miss them if they were gone. I think there's someone in here who doesn't know the value of their life. And I just want to speak to you and say that God sees you in that place right now. It is okay that you feel that way, but it is not true. You are valued, you are important and you are loved by God. And actually, you're loved by more people than you realize. There are people that would miss you. There are people that rely on you, that depend on you, that love you so much. And that is the enemy trying to confuse you and trying to speak death to you when God only speaks life. You have value, you have purpose, and there are plans for your life. And there is no guilt and shame in feeling that way. It is okay to feel that way. Bring it to God and let him show you that it is not true. Bring that pain and that sorrow and that hurt to him and allow him to speak truth in those places of pain. 
even if it just comes as fleeting thoughts, you don't have to live with that. You don't have to battle that. The truth of who you are can push all of that out. And I believe that today is a turning point for you. That at this point, God is speaking his truth in your heart and you're receiving it. And that struggle, that struggle with believing that you are not enough, that you could end your life and no one would care is not going to be a struggle for you anymore. Father, I just thank you for anyone who has struggled with thoughts of suicide, Father, anyone that has struggled with thoughts of not being enough or wondering if people would miss them if they were gone. God, I ask that you grab their hearts right now. Grab their hearts and tell them how much you mean to them. He is spotlighting you this morning because you matter that much. We are taking time this morning for you because you matter that much to God. He wants all of you. He wants you to believe who it is that he calls you to be. He would have come and died just for you, just for you. It doesn't matter what you have done, what has happened to you, what you will do. He loves you because he made you his child. And God, I thank you that there is a shift this morning. That the truth will set you free. And that it is his perfect love that casts out the lies and the fear that the enemy wants to speak. Let's lift our voices and sing that all together. Father, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the words that you speak to us, God. You are relentless coming after us with the truth and with your love for us, Father. And Lord, we just repent of anywhere we haven't believed it. And we don't allow those lies and those doubts to come in anymore, Father. We, we want to believe your truth. We want to receive your love, God. We thank you for this, this time with you. We thank you for this worship we had with you, Father, and for the the sweet moments, God, of you revealing who you are to us and growing closer and closer to you, Father. We thank you for your presence and for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're not already seated, you can go ahead and have a seat this morning. Can we give it up for our worship team? Aren't they so good?
I feel like a lot of times we say that and they're already off the stage, so I wanted to catch it. First, first thing, right? Well, we are so blessed that you are guys are here with us this morning. If you don't know where you are, you're at Genesis Church today. Uh, I'm Leslie Absher. I get to be part of the teaching team. I'm, I'm just blessed to be part of this uh, group here. And um, we really, I know that might have been a little bit heavy this morning, but we, we really believe in the moving of the Spirit and that we sort of go where God leads us to go. And uh, thank you for going there with me this morning. We love when God uh, moves and he ministers to his people as a group. We love coming together with all of you and, and those of you watching too. We're, we're just thankful for you to be with us this morning. Um, one of the things we love to do uh, as part of our worship is giving. So giving is not something um, that we check off our to-do list, although sometimes it, it can feel like that. Ideally, giving is a way for us to show generosity and, and thankfulness to God for what he has given to us. It is a way for us to to give back and to show trust with him. Um, I remember when we um, first started giving as a married couple and we had very, very little money. Um, and it was like, well, we could use that to buy groceries. And we, we were like naming what the money was that was going out the door. And it, it was like killing our faith to give because we were thinking about it as money to buy stuff that we needed as opposed to a faith um, move, right? A way to say, all right, God, we trust you that you'll give us everything that we need, right? And so I think that it's, it's hard sometimes when you think about money to think about it that way, but um, it's really not about the money. It's about um, trusting the Lord to give you what you need, and it doesn't actually even really matter the amount, honestly, and we can talk more about this if you want to talk to me about it, but uh, really it's about the act of giving, the act of trust and faith that you're putting in God to um, honor him with your finances. And so I'm just going to pray over that, and you can give online. There's lots of ways to do it, igenesischurch.com slash give. There's a giving station in the back if you want to drop checks or cash or things in the back, or you can also mail it, um, but let's just pray over the offering. So, Father, we just thank you for uh, just changing our, our mindset and our hearts and our attitudes towards giving, that we don't think about the money, but we think about uh, your faithfulness and, and a way for us to give back and honor that faithfulness in our lives, a way to show that we put our trust in you to be our provider, to be the one who cares for us and gives us everything that we need. And so we thank you, Father, that as we give this morning, that it will be an act of faith. It will be an act of investing in uh, our faith and trusting in you and, and believing that you are there for us. And so we thank you, Father, that uh, you bless each and every person and uh, you help them to uh, have a cheerful heart as we give, Father, and, and, and honor you in our giving. And we thank you, too, Father, that as we give, uh, that that seed will be multiplied, that it will do more than we could ever imagine that it will do, and not only in our own lives, but in the lives of those all over the world, too, through missions and through this church, Father. We just thank you that um, we're also able to bless others when we give. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I have lost my MC notes. Give me a second. Okay. Thanks. We're good. All right. So those of you that are new with us this morning at Genesis Church, so what we used to do when I first came was we would make you, like, stand up and wave at us and that's what my husband loves, that kind of stuff. Uh, so we don't do that anymore. Uh, what we do instead is you certainly can wave at me if you want to if you're new, but you can also text the word new uh, to our Genesis Church number, 812-393-1410. Text the word new. We just want to know who you are. We'd like to send you some information about our church so you can figure out how you can get involved. We will not spam you, um, but we do want to just send you something about Genesis so you can stay connected and learn how to stay connected. And as a thank you for doing that, uh, uh, we also love Chick-fil-A, so we're going to give you a $5 Chick-fil-A gift card. Um, I was just there this week with my son, and we got a little ice cream cones. Five bucks will get you two lovely, or six, six bucks. Oh, look at that. Six dollars. Inflation. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's everywhere. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Get two little ice cream cones for your $6 Chick-fil-A gift card, so uh, enjoy that on us. We, we appreciate you, and we're glad that you have joined us to worship this morning. Uh, and speaking of that, if you are new, maybe it's not your first Sunday, um, but you're still kind of trying to figure out Genesis Church and who we are and what we do, uh, we have these classes called Discover uh, once a month where you can just sort of ask questions and get to know the pastors and get to know EJ and uh, learn about what the beliefs of the church are, what the vision of the church are, what the mission is. Maybe you've been here a while and you're like, I still don't know that. Come to Discover. We would love to talk to you about it, right? So uh, if you feel like you want to come, you're welcome. Anyone is welcome to come. It'll be right back here uh, in this room room. If you ever also ever wondered what happens back there, you can just go to Discover and then you'll know. Um, so stage right room right after church today. Uh, EJ would love to chat with you and just hang out and get to know you more. So you are welcome to come to that. 
All right, so March, we have a couple things going on two Sundays from now. Uh, it's March 17th, so a few things happening on March 17th that we want to tell you about. Um, we're going to talk about March Madness, even though it is a sad year this year for March Madness. We're not going to talk about those that shall not be named across the street. We will instead talk about what we're going to do here for March Madness. Uh, so what we're going to do on the 17th is we're going to have a mac and cheese pitch-in. So bring your best, yeah, ooh, uh, yeah, mac and cheese pitch-in, right? So it's not really a contest. It's not a judging. It's not anything like that. It's just a pitch-in, right? It doesn't cost anything. We're just going to hang out in the back and eat mac and cheese. It doesn't get better than that, right? So come hang out, eat mac and cheese. At staff meeting, we're like, should we just have mac and cheese? Should we have sides? So Stephanie and I were thinking like sides, like, you know, vegetables. And EJ's like, well, we could have bacon and hot sauce. And we're like, oh, okay, yeah, we could have those sides too, sure. Uh, so th there may be bacon and hot sauce. I don't know. Um, we may or may not have vegetables. Uh, but we'll definitely have mac and cheese. So if you want mac and cheese, if you want to come hang out, we would love to have you. Uh, there will be a sign-up that is uh, somewhere online. Okay, sign up, text sign up to 812-393-1410, the Genesis Church number. Ooh, I remembered it. Sign up, 812-393-1410. Uh, if you don't want to do that, just come tell us and bring, or just come bring mac and cheese. Come on, just bring more mac and cheese is always good, right? So come on the 17th and bring some mac and cheese. We're going to have mac madness, which will be fun. Uh, we also are trying to raise money for missions, and so we're going to auction off these little, well, they're not little, uh, these large wood sculptures that were those, have you seen them? Are they in our lobby right now? They're not in our lobby. We'll put them out maybe in future weeks so you can see them, but they're giant IU wooden sculptures that are really awesome, and so if that's something that you want to bid on in order to raise money for missions, we would love to do that. So that's going to happen at Mag Mac Madness. Dennis Cunningham made them and donated them, so that's great. Um, so all the proceeds will go towards the missions, which is wonderful. And then also, last thing, it's a big day on the 17th, March 17th. Uh, we're really excited because we have Derek Britt. Woo-woo! Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so Derek Britt is going to be our guest speaker on the 17th. So really exciting. Derek Britt, if you don't know, uh, is one of the pastors of Chi Alpha. So he is going to come and hang out with us that Sunday and speak that Sunday. And, of course, he comes on Mac and Cheese Sunday, so he gets to stay and have Mac and Cheese with us. So that'll be great. So you don't want to miss the 17th, right? There's three things happening in the 17th, macaroni, money for missions, and Derek Britt. Too bad his name doesn't start with an M, but it's all right. Uh, so come on the 17th. We will love to have you, I think. Oh, we have one more announcement. I know we should have done Derek Britt last. Um, one more announcement. <laughs> Easter is also coming, okay? So Easter is Saturday, March, no, 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 it's not. It's, it's Sunday, March 31st. But on Saturday, March 30th, there's going to be an Easter egg hunt and a breakfast uh, at the warehouse. This is so fun. I mean, there's, I, I don't know how many eggs there are, it, infinity number of eggs. Um, which somehow the kids, you know, pick up in like 10 seconds, they're all gone, even though there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of eggs. I mean, I'm not kidding. There's eggs everywhere. The entire floor is just covered in eggs. So we're taking donations. One of the things we are going to provide is not the eggs. That's already taken care of. But we're going to provide bags of individually wrapped candy. And then they also do the pancake breakfast, which is really great because it serves a lot of the community. Tons of people who come that are not Christians are there. And we get to serve them with pancake mix and syrup bottles. So if you want to bring those things, please do. We need that stuff. Um, I don't know how many people they had last year. Do you guys know, Darcy? 500 people that came last year, so lots of pancake mix and syrup. We, we, we need that from you. Um, and if you want to serve, I know Dave and Nancy would, would love to have you serve as well. Our church is really good about this. You all step up and help when the warehouse needs help, so thank you so much for that. Um, but it is a really fun day. All the kids and families love it. And it's a cool thing to invite friends to. It's something that my neighbors and non-Christian friends, I can invite them to and, and be part of it, and it's a really neat thing. So um, we love helping out the warehouse. So thank you for that. Please bring those things in before Saturday, March 30th. So the 17th would be a really good day to also bring your syrup and your pancake mix. Uh, all right, I think that's all my announcements. Please welcome up Pastor EJ. Thank you, Leslie. All right, good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to church. We had some church today already. Whoo, man. 
we could go home after that, but we're not going to because I spent a week preparing for you. <laughs> so you're my prisoners for the next couple minutes. Just kidding. Open it with me in your Bibles, please, to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Um, as you're turning there, uh, we're picking up where we left off last week, verse 11. Um, but as you're turning there, uh, just another quick thing to be aware of since we're talking about Easter. Easter's coming on March 31st, and Easter is always a very special day here at the church. And so we, we put a lot of intentionality into it uh, because it's the main reason we're all here. Like that, like what we're celebrating that day is the main reason we're here, the resurrection of Jesus, the life that he gives. And, uh, and so what we do every Easter is we do water baptisms. And so we're excited about that. Um, I know that there are several people who have talked to us already about being part uh, of that service and getting water baptized. And so if you have uh, been wanting to get baptized, um, we have this opportunity for you. Um, can you throw that sign-up slide back, the sa same one um, that we were showing before? If you text the word sign-up, one word, to that number on the screen, it'll send you the same link, and on that link uh, is the ability to check off sign-up. And there are also, because there's some kind of other stuff you got to do, um, there's information and applications and a family devotional guide in case your kid wants to get baptized. We have a whole packet to help you walk through that with your child. Um, so you can make that decision. All that is at the welcome table uh, out there, uh, which is the curve table right when you exit uh, the sanctuary um, in the entryway. And uh, so if you want to get baptized, we would love for you to be part of that. We want to celebrate that with you, we, with you. We do that right in the middle of service during worship. And uh, it's incredible. It's always fun. And I'm super stoked uh, with the people I know who are getting baptized this year. We're very excited. So if you want to do that, please text sign up to that number and let us know and we'll get you hooked up. Uh, all right. So we've been, we've been talking about Titus. We've been talking about um, this spiritual son of the Apostle Paul who's been, who, who was left by Paul on the island of Crete, an island full of basically pirates who, um, and that's not a joke, they really were pirates, and uh, they, they did all sorts of things, they, they have crazy lifestyle, crazy system of living, um, crazy worldviews, like they just, they just weren't in it, um, very harmful lives, and they get saved, and they come into the church, and there's a lot of mess and baggage that they bring with them into that church, and so Titus, uh, this whole letter from Paul to his spiritual son is really to encourage him, um, but to also tell him what he needs to do. And since this is being read to the congregation, it's also like I'm talking to Titus, but hello, pay attention, everybody, because we're reading it out loud in front of everyone. Um, and so uh, th this is very important. Uh, everything that he's saying, how do, how do we live this life? What does spiritual maturity look like? What, what does good, healthy church look like? How does that function? What do healthy leaders in the church look like? Um, and, and last week we talked about um, the household codes that were so common in the empire, in the Roman Empire, in their Greco-Roman world. Um, the relationships that were uh, typical in any given household and how those relationships should interact with each other, how people should interact. So men with women, uh, older men with young men, uh, even slavery, we talked, we talked about all of that. And not just how the world at their, in their day expected them to live, but Paul flips the whole idea of these household codes and headship and power and domination, flips it all on its head, and he talks about equality and justice and love and kindness with each other. Um, and so we talked about all of that last week, and we're kind of picking up mid-conversation to all of that. And so we're going we're to be reading here in verse 11 in just a moment, but uh, I want to kind of set up the stage, if I can, for what we're actually going to be talking about, because we're talking about one of my favorite things to talk about today, and that's how grace, how God's grace can transform your life, how it actually changes you and makes you a new creation. Um, so this is, we're, we're officially in March, March 3rd. This is the month uh, that I gave my life to the Lord 22 years ago long time ago, I know. So, so and then there are some other saints who are like, you're still pipsqueak in the Lord, right? Um, but, uh, but 22 years ago, I gave my life to the Lord this month. And uh, I've shared my testimony with many of you before, but 
Um, just to kind of recap, because there's something I want to point out in my testimony. I, I lived most of my childhood in the church. Grew up in the church, um, uh, and uh, I lived most of that away from the Lord as well. So even though I was in the church, up until about 15 years old, um, I, I was far from the Lord, even though I was in the church. I believed in God, believed that he was the one true God. I had a Christian worldview that at first I adopted from my parents, but but I actually came to believe and think this is the right way to live life. Um, I knew that I should obey his ways and live his ways and do good, obey God. I, I knew all of those things. I believed in all of those things, and still I was far from God. Um, but I did. I, I tried to obey God as much as I could, except for letting him be Lord of my life. Um, but in everything else, I really tried my very best to follow him, to obey him. I, I thought that I could do that. I thought I could have the best of both ways. I thought that that would somehow earn some brownie points or some extra credit or something that would balance things out for me to my eternal account, if you will. Um, but there was an important truth that I really just did not realize um, at, at that time while I was trying to live that way. Um, that, that truth is that obedience before grace is realized in your life is not actually obedience. It's obligation. We're doing things because we think we have to do things and we think it's the right thing to do, but there's an obligation to it. Because obedience, what obedience, we've mixed this up in with, with, with how we understand the word in our culture. Obedience has to deal with, I, I'm going to just do it because I have to, because uh, I have an authority over me, and that's what they expect of me. And if I don't do that, then there's a consequence for it. And so I'm, I'm going to avoid the consequence because at minimum, I'm really good at self-preservation as a human. And so I'm going to obey. That's not what real obedience is. That's just obligation. Obedience, before grace is realized, is just purely obligation, and it can really help us to be good people. It can, it can help us do good things in the world. It can help us stay in line. It can help bring order. It can, it, it, it can do all sorts of things, this obligation, this, this sense of doing the right thing out of obligation, but it's not the same as obedience that comes from a heart of love. It's just not. It doesn't produce any real transformation in my heart. It, it can't do that. Grace must be realized first so that we can actually begin to obey God and live out the ways of God. Obedience comes to me, and, and it's lived out in my life, when my heart loves and trusts God more than it loves and trusts myself. That's when you get to obedience. When you start doing good, when you start living the life of Jesus, walking in his ways because you love him and you trust him to lead your life more than you love yourself, more than you trust yourself to lead your life, that's when obedience comes. And that only happens when we have a revelation of the grace of God, of our unmerited favor with God, something we didn't earn, of this unconditional love that we have with God, that no matter what I do or don't do, whether good or evil, he loves me. And nothing can change that. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. When we get, when we just don't intellectually understand that, but when that becomes reality to us, it has a powerful impact on your life. It trans forms you. Once we get that revelation and that order right, it starts to shape us practically in this world into the likeness of Christ, into the sons and daughters of God that we already are because of what he did at the cross. That status and that identity that we already have because of what Jesus has done through obedience, through, through grace that empowers obedience, we begin to be shaped and formed and molded practically. But we don't always live from our identity. We don't always live from our status. That may be what Jesus purchased for us. That may be what he declares over us, but we don't always live from that identity. And what's crazy to me, especially in my testimony, is that it's entirely possible 
to believe that God is the one and only true God and yet not put my trust in him. It's absolutely crazy and entirely possible to adopt a Christian worldview intellectually, but to live a life of apathetic devotion. To where, like, I believe this, I, I, I would defend this. Someone asks me, I'll, I'll declare this over my life, that this is what I believe. But then I won't actually take the hard steps to walk it out. It's entirely possible to claim to be a Christian and then never take one step in the footsteps of Jesus. That is not only crazy and possible, it's scary. It's scary because you deceive yourself into thinking, I have this life. I'm walking in this life. I'm, I'm living in this life. That it, it, it's crazy that you can think you have life and be devoid of it at the same time. And that was my story. That's my testimony. That's, what, that's, that's the story of many people who can identify with me, who, who that was your story growing up. But when that story gets interrupted by God's grace, by his unconditional love, something changes deep within you. You realize that the you that you were holding back from God is not actually the real you. You go through this kind of existential crisis or awakening where you realize, oh my goodness, everything I thought I was is not who I actually am. Like all those words that were spoken over me, all those lies that I had believed that people had said about me, all those things that I thought about myself, all the failures, all the pain, all the hurt, all the betrayal, all those things that shaped me and molded me into this version of myself, that's not actually who I am. That's not who I am. And when God's unconditional love, when this grace comes to you and you encounter it and you open your heart to God, it changes you. It transforms you because the real you that you were born to be is buried under countless layers of those lies and heart wounds and manipulation and empty promises and disappointment. All of those things created this facade that we've held on to for dear life. I'm going to do me. I got to look out for me. Like you only live once. Like I'm going to live this life. This is who I am. I'm not going to let anybody come at me and tell me anything. I'm not going to, like anyone challenges me, they're just a narcissist. And like we start accusing people who may have good intentions. And then people come that we trust and they wound us and, and, and that creates all sorts of baggage. It cre all of this creates a facade that the world and the flesh within you tries to convince you this is you. Protect it, fight for it, don't let anybody take it away from you. And it's all a lie. Only the grace of God can expose that. Only the grace of God can free us from that facade and give us life and the ability to obey him and walk in his ways so that we can really, truly live, that we could be made whole. This experience that I've just spent some time here describing before we even read our text, this experience with God's grace sets in motion a process of becoming, becoming day by day more and more like the sons and daughters of God, or as how Peter puts it in his first epistle in first Peter, he says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That sounds so foreign to think that you're royalty, to think that you're of value, to think that you are priestly and worthy and set apart and holy, but that's exactly who you are. And only God's grace can make you awaken to that and empower you to live that out. Grace trains us to obey so we can become. Grace trains us to obey so we can become. Let's read Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. As I said earlier, Paul had just finished up talking about all these instructions about how we should live 
with one another and relate to one another as new creations, even in the midst of fallen and broken structures and governments and systems in our world, um, how we're to live with one another. He gives all these instructions. And, and, you know, why should we actually obey these instructions? Well, Paul answers it here. For the grace of God has appeared. He's brought salvation for all people in verse 11. He's brought grace to us. It's appeared to us, and he's brought salvation to all people. Say all. All means all people. All. This is a very big deal. Um, God, Jesus has revealed God to the world. He's made us whole, and he invites us to share in his life. And this, this idea of what God has appeared and done on behalf of humanity is an, is an entirely foreign idea to the way that the Cretan people understood who the gods were. To them, to the people of Crete, they had a very specific understanding of the Greek gods. They, were, they believed they were humans who ascended and became gods through great acts of good and heroism. You ever see the, the old Disney, like the 90s Disney movie, Hercules? Yeah, that was my, that was my movie growing up. But that whole movie is this idea. Hercules is like kind of this half human, half God, but he's got to be a hero before he can become a God. And, and so this is, this is what he does. This is what he gets to. And this is how the Cretans viewed the gods. They were these, the, these men and women who through some heroic feat, some massive undertaking, they earned the right to ascend and become gods. But once they got there, it was their divine right to take whatever they wanted and do whatever they wanted. Because, hey, they're the gods, right? Like, they earned it. This is, this is they have all the power. They have all the authority. They can do it. Um, and, so, and so they've really viewed this way. And these gods used their divine attributes and powers to do and get whatever they wanted. And when they appeared to humanity, they would come, often being described as granting favors or doing Incredible things that those favors uh, could also be called graces. They granted graces to people, but they were always self-serving. For example, Zeus, which is so prominent on Gre uh, on the island of Crete, as we talked about before, his birthplace. Zeus often came in deceptive form to women to trick them into sleeping with him and doing all sorts of other um, horrible things to humanity by coming in deceitful forms. Sometimes these guys just wanted to be deceitful just because they were bored. And so they decided to test a poor human person with an impossible test just to, just to unleash their frustration on them. I mean, these were how they understood the gods. And when a god appeared, it was never a good thing. It was always uh, something terrifying that was going to happen. Now, what's more is that the Cretan people idolized Zeus for his deception and his womanizing nature. I mean, it's wild that they worshiped him and idolized him this way. But when it comes to talking about Jesus, Paul speaks very differently about his nature. In verse 13, he says, he's our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is not a man who became a God, rather he is God. And this God does not use his divinity or his power to abuse humanity, to deceive them in order to get what he wants. Instead, when Jesus appeared to us, to humanity in this world, he showed us unmerited favor, grace. He showed us unconditional love by saving us from sin and death, by laying his life down on the cross so that we could be set free and we could have his life and he could breathe life into our lifeless being. That's who Jesus is. That's what he did when he showed up. He didn't appear to get anything from us. He showed up purely to give and to bless us, to give us grace. According to Paul, nobody has been left out. Not one person in all humanity, in all history, has been left out. Everyone has been forgiven at the cross. God's grace and his salvation has come to all and he's been revealed to all. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, young or old. It doesn't matter if you're a mature Christian or a pagan pirate on Crete. It doesn't matter how decent or wicked your past was. It doesn't matter if you're a person of power, status, and influence, or you have none of it. Everyone needs, every single person 
needs a revelation of the grace of God. They need to understand why Jesus came and why he appeared. And, and that grace has a profound impact on everyone who would open their hearts to receive it. It begins to work deeply in a person's life, not just to save them, but to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring freedom to, to things that have held us in bondage, to bring wholeness to our lives. It transforms a person until they become a mature son and daughter of God. Grace trains us to obey so that we can become. The point of grace is so we can become something more. Verse 12, the grace of God has appeared, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Uh, according to Paul, God's grace trains us for two things here. Number one, how to, rec how, how to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, literally how to disown or disavow our allegiance to ungodliness, to sinful practices, to worldly passions. That's the first thing it trains us to do, but God's grace, when it comes to us, it trains us how to live godly lives and do good works, even in the midst of a broken, sinful society. So in other words, another way of saying it is that God's grace trains us to leave behind our former lifeless ways and to live a transformed life as the free children of God. That's what God's grace come and trains us to do. Now, someone who uses the grace of God, who reads about it and understands it intellectually and takes it and uses it to justify sinfulness in their life, they're not actually walking in grace. That's the abuse of grace. True grace, when we experience it, when we live it out, it trains us in godliness and in doing good, good works, living out the way of Jesus, the way of love. And because when you know that you're loved unconditionally, you start to become a completely different person. The closest thing we have is with our parents, the, the love of a parent for their child. And even that, there's so many examples of imperfection in this world, of bad parents who, who, who don't give that to their children. Um, but even on our best day as parents, like we're still falling. We're, we're, we're still fallible. We still have issues and we still wound. Our kids, it doesn't matter how perfect your parent is, you will be wounded by your parent. And that's just part of a fallen uh, world that we live in. But we, we can understand this concept in part of God's unconditional love and, and feeling that. A, a child, statistically, who is raised with that kind of love has so, much, so many better chances to live out from a healthy, uh, emotionally balanced, uh, mentally balanced life. Like they, they have that ability because they've been raised with that and shown that and, and given that all their life. Unconditional love has a way of changing us. And if that is what happens with imperfect parents, how much more does the perfect Heavenly Father, when he shows his grace to us, does that have the power to transform us and change us and help us live from a true, healthy identity? The grace of God trains us. It raises us up to live this new life. Um, actually, I actually really love uh, the UFC and mixed martial arts. Anybody? Fan out there? No. Nobody, oh, no fans. I'm by myself. That's Okay. That's okay. I can, I can own what I love. I love uh, mixed martial arts and, and uh, the UFC and, and all of that. I love the boxing. I, I will never step in a ring or a cage in my life, but I will watch two other guys go and beat themselves bloody. I will watch that all day long. It's super, super fun. Um, but one of, one of my favorite movie franchises is the Rocky Balboa movies. Oh, man. Like, like if you're going to hold on to your man card, you got to own these movies. Like that, these movies of Rocky Balboa, they just, they spoke something to me as a kid and I love them so much. But the Rocky movies follow the same kind of formula. Um, the Rocky Balboa movies have the same kind of formula where uh, there's a challenger that comes. Rocky's kind of always the underdog. And, uh, and then they're go, they go in, the, like the fight date is set and then there's the massive intense training montage with the sweet 80s music, right? Like, that's, the, that's that part. And then they get into the actual fight. 
and and then a victor victor is uh, is announced and this is this is rocky's formula throughout every single one but when it comes to the training there's always uh, very strict rules there's a super strict diet the the workouts are crazy the regimen is is nuts um, it, it's and he, and they go hard uh, there's activities he can do and cannot do there are there are things that that he's allowed to uh, give his attention to and other things he can't. Um, he, this is, this is how it happens. And by the end, the peak of that training, when he gets to the end, he has this fully trained body where he's ready for this fight. But have you ever thought what happens after the fight? It's like the cool montage and they go and he's like peak body built performance, which I will probably never be. But, um, this peak performance body ready to like, like you're hitting steel and what, but what happens after the fight? Like, you train for it, and you get to it, and, and any time Rocky ever loses, because he didn't, he didn't take seriously training in the offseason, in between the fights. So he gets to the fight, he wins, and then he comes out at the end, and, and does he take the next fight as seriously as that one? There's a, there's a rising um, star in the UFC by the name of Patty Pimblett, and he's, uh, he's from England, and this guy's hysterical, because as soon as the fight's over and he goes to the interview, he just starts eating pizza. Like, he just starts down and stuff. And, and it's become this comical thing where, like, he, like he gains, like, 50, 60 pounds in the offseason. And then when it comes time for training, he, he like, loses it all and gets shredded again. And, but it, it's hysterical to me because that is, that is the mentality of, of uh, many times an athlete or a competitor can have uh, in training. That's a lot of the times what we think about when it's training. It's like, oh, I got to train for a marathon. So now I'm going to actually start something or, or there's something difficult. I, I come to a health crisis in my life. And so now I need to start training my body differently. And so there's all these events or crises in which we think that's when training begins from event to event and crisis to crisis. But the training that Paul is talking about is very different. Paul's not talking about an athlete training for an event. He's, the training he's talking about is more of a child being trained by their parents to grow up and to mature and to live a life. It's training for life itself, not for an event. Friends, we can't treat our relationship with Jesus as if it's some sort of an event that we can participate in when it's convenient or when we really feel like it or when we hit crisis mode. And then all of a sudden, we really need to walk out his ways and live his ways. That, that's not what this training is. This training is an ongoing day-by-day -day training that the grace of God, as we, as we have this relationship with him and we walk and we learn about him in this unconditionally loving relationship, it trains us for life, for a new reality itself. The training of grace educates us in the ways of true life. It teaches us how to live a fruitful disciplined life. It teaches us how to master our flesh and deny its influence. The training of grace lovingly corrects us and guides us to make amends and to repent of wrongdoing that we may have committed. It guides us to honor and to serve other people because we have experienced what, what God's honor towards us to lay down his life and to save us and to redeem us. We've experienced that honor. We've experienced the service of Jesus on our behalf, and so it guides us to honor and serve others, to be a blessing in the world, to demonstrate God's goodness. But the training of grace also comes into our life, and it confronts us when we allow pride and hurt to get in the way of forgiving other people that we should forgive. It challenges us when we all of a sudden get blinded by selfish ambition or the love of money or we fall for the allure of more, bigger, better, brighter, shinier. That's how my life will be good. When we fall for that, it challenges us. See, grace trains us to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves, to live this kingdom life and follow the ways of Jesus in this world. That's what grace trains us for. And this, is, this kind of a life is a far cry from the people and the lifestyles that Titus is pastoring. A far cry from who, who he's pastoring. Um, they you would almost look at them and be like, wow, Titus, you got your work cut out for you. Like, they're that kind of a person. Like, this is really hard. They're almost like a lost cause, but you go for it, Titus. If you think you could do it, go for it. 
But Paul doesn't come at him with any hesitancy at all or, or, or trying to bring down his expectations so he doesn't disappoint himself. Paul doesn't write his letter like that at all. In fact, he writes with full confidence. He says, listen, this is important. Teach them how to do this. Rebuke when they're wrong. Correct them. Walk in grace. Model for them. Do all of these things and don't let anybody tell you to stop. Don't let anybody convince you to back down from telling them who they are and how to walk in God's ways. Paul, Paul comes boldly into them because the Cretans are not a lost cause. Even the worst sinner that you can imagine is not forever lost. They are not incapable of being transformed by God's grace. The real truth is that the only reason any of us can actually come and have life in Jesus and, and walk in his ways is because of the grace of God that has come to each and every one of us. None of us deserved it. There was no way for us to earn it. There was no way for us to prove ourselves worthier than another person of receiving it. God's grace and his salvation has appeared and come to us all. Every single one of us. Because that's what grace is. It's God's unmerited favor. It is his love given intentionally to those who don't deserve it. The only way that we are actually deserving of God's love is purely because he loves us. And he says we're deserving of it. The only way we can live like Jesus is because God's loving grace has come to us. We've had a revelation of it. And we've opened ourselves to the transformative power of the Holy Spirit to work in us and change us. Cretans were not made in the image of Zeus or any other deity that was self-serving or sinful. Cretans were made in the image of God, even if it's buried under layers of lifeless behavior. But even if it is buried, even if that life, even if that identity is buried beneath the facade, deep beneath the facade to where you can't even imagine anything could be under there, that life can be rediscovered. Who you are can be discovered. It can be uncovered and found. You can be remade, renewed, and restored. And they, these screens, they could become everything that God's grace and salvation came to restore to them, to transform them into, and so can every single one of you. Amen? Every single one of us can have that same experience. Friends, whatever has happened in your life that you think has permanently scarred you, that you think has permanently messed you up, whatever, whatever that thing is, you need to know I'm here to give you hope today. You need to know that God's grace can not only save you, but it can heal you. It can deliver you. It can set you free. It can transform you. If some person in your life has appeared suddenly in your life and they made you think that they were there to bless you with graces, and favors, but they only used you for their own selfish gain. I want you to know today that the twisting that you experienced in your heart and your mind because of them, it's not permanent. It can be undone. It can absolutely be undone. You can be made whole again. You can find peace. You can find wholeness. You can find joy again. And these painful experiences, they can be so impactful that they can leave us feeling disfigured, unlovely, unworthy. It can leave us feeling like that, but that's not how life was meant to be lived. And that's certainly not what Jesus gave his life for you to become. And that's the entire point behind God's grace and salvation coming to us. It has come to us to give us a taste of what this renewed world is like, what this kingdom is like, what we were created to be ultimately. It gives us that taste of what we all long for, of a abundant life, of a life of fullness and wholeness and completeness, of joy, of peace. That's what Jesus' grace and salvation came to work in us. Luke, if you could come on up, we're going to bring this down. Verse 14, the grace of God has appeared through God, our God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now, it's not an exhaustive list, but to the Cretans and to Titus, Paul identifies three reasons why Jesus gave his life. To redeem us, to purify us, and to make us zealous for good works. 
To redeem us uh, literally means to set free or to purchase back. And so the, this redemption that Jesus worked for us was that he ransomed us from the power of sin and death. We were hopelessly in bondage to it, lost in hopelessness, uh, completely at the mercy of our sinful passions that would rise up and take over. No choice, no option to control it. it it's just how we were. We were bound as humanity in this sin and in this brokenness, but Jesus redeemed us from that. He brought us out of that bondage. He set us free. Number two, to purify us, literally to separate from defilement, to clean. When someone's unkept and they don't really take care of themselves, uh, but then they get a makeover, you know, like all those shows that is on what, TLC and all, what I don't know, all those crazy shows. Um, we call that, wow, what a transformation. They don't even look like themselves. They look like a whole new person, a different person entirely. That's, those are things that we say. But instead of cleaning their skin and giving a haircut and a shave or, or giving a person a new wardrobe, Jesus transforms the inner life of a person. He completely makes you new from the inside out entirely. That spiritual bondage that kept you bent over and twisted in a deformed version of yourself, Jesus breaks that off of you. He heals that in you. And what's, what's left, what remains is a brand new life in every sense of the word. And then lastly, Jesus makes us zealous or passionate to do good works. Part of this transformation, when you encounter the grace of God and you open yourself and you know that you're loved unconditionally, when you know who you are, who he actually created you to be, and you get set free from that facade, when all of that stuff breaks off of you, suddenly part of that transformation is that your core desires within you begin to actually change. This is why someone who's been addicted to drugs and alcohol for years of their life and it ruined them, this is why in a moment for some of them, it can be completely broken off of them. There's no detox. There's no weaning them off. There's no slowly getting over it. They can just go cold turkey and be done with it. That was my father-in-law's experience. Where's his dad? That was his experience. Completely addicted to alcohol. Got saved, boom. Not one drop for the rest of his life. It's incredible. It, your core desire begins to change. Now hear me. The desire to feed your flesh with sin, that still stays. That's still a struggle. That's still a battle, but it's no longer a core desire. It's not part of who you are anymore. Because of Jesus, you begin to desire things that actually lead to life. You begin to desire things that produce good, not just in your life, but good fruit in the world. You begin to live a different way according to a kingdom culture instead of a worldly culture. You start doing good works and walking the way of love, not because it's right, not because you have to, not because you're afraid of judgment if you don't, but because you've been changed and that's what you desire. You desire to live a different way, a way of wholeness. You begin to live out grace. And as you do, you end up playing a significant role in building the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven, right where you are, right wherever you are. And not trying to change it from the outside in, but from the inside out. As you live within the abusive and unhealthy and unjust systems and structures of the empire, of the world around you, like what Paul, we talked about last week, was saying. You don't do it from the outside in by waging a culture war or, or drawing self-righteous lines in the sand between you and your neighbor. It's not how we do it. We do it from the inside out. As we live this life out faithfully, day in and day out, and over time, you set in motion a real transformation in healing that can come to our world because you're playing your part in revealing God's grace and salvation through Jesus to everyone because grace trains us to obey so we can become. Lastly, verse 15, and we're closing with this. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. To see this kind of transformation in Crete, it was imperative that Titus would declare these things. Speak them boldly. He's got to remind the people of who they really actually are because of what Jesus has done. Because of life they have in Jesus. 
You must call them to stand up and, and depart from their old ways and to live out who they actually truly are. They got to expose sin, unhealthy behavior, and harmful teachings for the lifeless things that they actually are and help people just abandon them, give them up, lay them aside. And in doing all these things, he needs to do them, letting no one disregard him, literally meaning to despise him or to dismiss him as lesser or unimportant. In other words, he should not allow their behavior towards Titus or towards others to keep him from telling them who they really are in Christ. Tell them over and over and over again until they experience this revelation. That's what we do here at Genesis. We will tell you over and over and over again who you actually truly are. We will not judge you or, co or, or condemn who you are. We know who you are, but, but you got to live up to who you are. You got to live, you got to abandon the things that are wounding you in life and harming others, the things that are pulling you back when Jesus wants to propel you forward in life. Many times we wonder why we can't get past this feeling of stuckness, and it's because we're holding on to that facade and trying to pull it along with us, and it's weighing us down. But you need to realize that if you can just open your heart to the grace of God, you'll see you don't need that facade. You don't need the lies. You don't need the things that you tell yourself to try to build up your self-esteem and confidence. All you need is Jesus and the Father's love. And then you will become everything that he's created you to be. His grace will train you and, 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 and mold you and form you. It will help you live a life of obedience because you love him. You'll walk in his ways and you'll realize what life actually is for many of us for the first time. That's what will happen if we do this. We need to keep teaching this truth and never shy away from it because this gospel message is not just a message. It's an invitation to wake up to this new reality. The world wants to convince you to hold on to that facade, to hold on to its ways, that its ways are gonna lead to life and peace and joy, but you need to realize that the reality has already changed 2,000 years ago. The world has already changed. And, and no matter how much the, the, the systems of this world and the powers and the authorities, no matter how much we try to hold on to, to our ways and to what we think is superior and better and, and, and fighting for power and domination, no matter how much it tries to hold on to it, it is a lost cause because the world is fading away and the new world has come. This new life, this new reality has come because the grace of God and his salvation has appeared to all people, to all flesh to show us who he is. It's an invitation to see Jesus, to experience his grace and forgiveness, and to receive his life. Would you stand with me? If you're here today and you've never made that decision to give Jesus the lordship of your life, no, never. If you're here today and you've not made a decision to follow Jesus, and if you're realizing today, maybe for the first time, that Jesus is the part of your life that you've been missing, then I just want you without hesitation just to raise your hand in this room here today. Without hesitation, just raise your hand in this moment. As an invitation to God, if you've never made that decision before, just lift it up to the Lord right here, right now. No one's judging you. No one's thinking anything differently about you. This is between you and God in this moment right now. I'm going to give it a moment. If that's you, nobody's looking around at you. Everyone's looking at me. If that's you and you've never made that decision before, just a few more moments. We want to give ample space for this. If you've never made that decision or you've realized you've walked away from what you knew was true, and you've tried holding on to that old you, that old life, and you need to make that decision anew today. I want you to put your hand in the air as an invitation to God. God, come. I want you to see me right now in this moment. Just a few more moments. I'm going to ask for this. Could everybody just close your eyes and bow your heads?
this gospel, this transformation is too important. I don't want to move past it too quickly. Thank you for those of you who've responded. But I want to give just one more moment. Maybe you need some anonymity. I want to give you whatever you need here today to make that choice with nobody looking around. If you're saying to yourself right now, Jesus, I need you. I need this revelation of grace. I need you to come into my life and to show me who I am. I need you to be Lord of my life. I want you to raise your hand throughout this room. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, hands going up. Is there anyone else? Just a moment more. Yeah. Praise God. Proud of you for doing that. That's a bold step. Anybody else? having Jesus and his life in you is worth to you giving up your old ways then I want you to say this Jesus I give you my life amen amen as simple as that now this is what I want everybody to do I want everybody to just close your eyes here in this moment keep them closed I want you to take a deep breath in and out Take a moment just to center your heart, your